This video essay aims for a fair comparison between 2002's Battlefield 1942 and 2016's much newer Battlefield 1. This is not a serious comparison. The criteria for comparison are as follows. Informative UI Open world aspect Modding Music AI Class systems Competition Controllers and game modes, with a quick conclusion after each, and one final conclusion at the end. I'm hoping with this to give you an insight into how DICE fared with their first development project, and ultimately their most recent, without bombarding you with my own nostalgia, while hopefully breaking down critical aspects of both games to see how things are potentially subjectively better or worse. But before all of this, let's get one thing out of the way. The history of DICE. In 1992, Digital Illusions was founded in Sweden by four people. They were members of a demo group referred to as The Silence. A demo group for those wondering were a group of people who were interested in computers and messing with code. Generally students who were to create auto-visual arts, showing from their talents of programming, to musical skills, to graphic design. While members of The Silence, they were also students of Vekwa University, with their office consisting of a tiny dorm room. Their first games were on the Amiga, both pinball games created in the same year, then Benefactor, their first side-scroller. Over the next eight years, they would create games that range from jumpstart safari field trips, racing games, and even Shrek. And then it all changed. Their first first-person shooter had been finished, along with five other titles in the very same year. Battlefield was wildly successful, selling 2.47 million copies and yielding two official expansions the year after release, and then 13 additional Battlefield titles since 1942's inception. On the 31st of March 2005, Electronic Arts became the majority shareholder, and changing the name from Digital Illusions HB to Digital Illusions CE AB, or as we know it now, DICE. But I'm super excited to get started, so let's get into it. The menu is easy enough to use, giving you all the options you expect. Campaign, multiplayer, option tabs, even a custom tab to enable your given mod. The in-game UI has a very clunky section up top of the screen for team callouts that to my knowledge players never used, but I can see why DICE would have wanted it so prominent being the easiest way to communicate since Skype didn't exist and TeamSpeak had only been out for two months. And with the internet being very slow in 2002, the last thing you'd want is another program chewing up your precious kilobytes. We have what's expected, a slim health bar, ammunition, map with players and coordinates, and remaining tickets per team, and luckily this is all very minimal if we ignore the pointless character thumbnail that doesn't represent your chosen class. In Battlefield 1, the in-game UI stays consistent through different forms of travel, but the minimap shifted from the top right in 1942 to the bottom left, with a running list of deaths and how they happen next to it. The tickets and objectives taken and owned are moved to the top middle, dead centre, and I guess it works, it draws the eye nicely. The bottom right is for ammunition and specials. There is a great lack of a callout tab along the top, which is awesome. The menu UI tabs are on the outskirts of the top and the left of the screen, a lot of them leading to a way to pay for loot crates, season passes and expansion content, along with all the newest Battlefield news. The left tab houses all of your Battlefield games, with the ability to search and join servers from this tab on any game you own. Up the top we have Home, Multiplayer, Campaign, Soldier, Store and more which houses basically all of your essential options like video, audio and key bindings. Both Battlefield 1942 and Battlefield 1 have a great tool for searching for multiplayer games, but if you don't own any of the DLC content, you'll find it hard, if not impossible, to find a game, and especially not a game mode that you want to play. There is not a lot wrong with the UIs, they're both pretty good, with the exception of a few things in 1942, like the top bar of callouts and the inaccurate representation of your class in the JPEG. Battlefield 1 streamlined the UI, making it very simple. There's also a grenade indicator that wasn't in 1942, to alert you when a grenade's in your proximity, allowing you to make the appropriate movements. In 1942, you had to look at the top for callouts, top right for the map, bottom right for ammunition, and the bottom left for life. But in Battlefield 1, you only need to look at the bottom of the screen, and the top centre, decluttering and freeing you to focus more on the game at hand. The recently added class rank progression screen has been a handy indicator of progression at the end of the game, so overall in my opinion these are all very good changes. The openness of the maps is the first thing you notice, giving you the opportunity to grab yourself a tank or jeep and charge like everybody else is, and take shots from a distance. The distance was so large and desolate in these maps that if you were to miss a vehicle at the start of the match, you would have to run the distance with not a lot to look at in the meantime. The land, sea and air aspects of this game include all of the usuals, jeeps, tanks, 
and all kinds of boats ranging from barges and ultimately battleships, bringing your spawn location as close to the shore as you could, along with a variety of bombing and shooting aeroplanes. Battlefield 1 opted for a faster paced experience that completely removed the option of taking off your plane, but rather spawned you inside of the plane, in the sky, removing the 30 seconds it took to run from your spawn to the plane, and take off, or potentially the 2 or 3 minutes waiting for a new one to spawn. Everything in this game is created in a way that shortens your time to combat, especially from the squad leader spawning system where you can spawn in your leader regardless of their position on the map, making it quicker for you to get into combat and ultimately, quicker matches. If you feel that these things have transformed the series into something you're no longer interested in, or you absolutely love the changes, it's completely up to you. One of the biggest introductions is Levolution, that happens in-game and transforms the landscapes to change the layout of a particular piece of the map. Unfortunately, it's not as useful or well known in Battlefield 1, but it was in previous titles like Battlefield 4. Various ground vehicles like light tanks, heavy tanks, and all kinds of turrets are available as well as bombers and combat aeroplanes, and as well as the obvious sea aspect too. What's new is the addition of massive boats, trains, and airships that assist you in particular game modes, but we'll talk about that later. The machinery-based combat hasn't changed, but with the addition of Levolution map events, quicker time to death and close combat maps, Battlefield has changed forever and we'll see where they go with the next iteration. Hopefully World War II era, with a lot of open maps with a choice between Battlefield 1 style maps and old school massive landscapes that lend to taking off and landing your own planes again, putting that into the player's hands. So overall, the maps have moved from very large static landscapes to medium sized dynamic ones with the world events and a sense of immersion unseen in the first game, not to take away from the fun of either. Mods for Battlefield 1942 were in my opinion one of the smartest decisions DICE were able to incorporate. Just looking on Mod Database right now, there's 18 mods created in the past 2 years ranging from conflicts in World War 1, desert combat that's set in the Middle East, and a soccer mod. The addition of mod support allowed the minds of communities to create whatever they liked. One of the most memorable for me was Interstate 1982, an 80s death race with massive maps that had you and your mates racing around the map, shooting each other in modified vehicles only armed with a wrench to fix your car. Sometimes you don't want to play official expansions or buy season passes, and you just want to play a silly mod with a few of your mates. As of writing this, there is really no longer a way to purchase or own Battlefield 1942 apart from a third party websites or torrents, which is upsetting for the historical significance of the game. Modding in Battlefield 1 is non-existent, with the publisher Electronic Arts urging back when Battlefield 3 was released that Frostbite 2 was far too complex, said EA's vice president. But then DICE's general manager Carl Magnus said this in reference to modding. We get that question a lot, I always answer the same thing, and then the community calls me bad names. We get the feedback, we understand it, we would also like to see more player created content. But we would never do something like this if we feel we couldn't do it 100%. That means we need to have the right tools available, we need to have the right security around this regarding what parts of the engine we let loose, so to say. So for Battlefield 4, we don't have any mod support planned. I have to be blunt about saying that, we don't. So in the end, it looks like it wasn't too complicated, but DICE are worried about the community finding vulnerabilities within the engine. And I totally get it, this may feel like an unfair comparison. The content DICE are still giving Battlefield 1 is great, don't get me wrong. But it's missing that community aspect that 1942 had. It made me wonder what else it could have been if DICE had given the tools into the hands of the community. Without mods, games like Counter-Strike, PUBG, and even the entire MOBA genre would never have been born. So I can only see it as a massive loss. So let me know about that in the comments. What do you think? The theme music for Battlefield 1942 has struck the same drum beat through every iteration of the franchise. From 1942 to Battlefield 2, Battlefield 3, and even Battlefield 1. I'll give a few seconds for each.
1942's theme starts off thunderous, and even when it was released in 2002, it was iconic and all of my mates would hum the tune off the top of their heads, not only because we played it so much, but because it was legitimately good. The combinations of an orchestra and a heavy beat set the tone for the game, and to my knowledge, being the only music in the game, it stood out like nothing else. A brief word about the sound effects too. For 2002 they were great, but like a lot of aspects currently very outdated. My favourite were the plane and the tank sound effects. time with the very same drum beat. Battlefield 1's theme is a super high call letter reminder that Battlefield isn't going anywhere, and it sets your expectations high. One of the most beautiful songs I heard in 2016 actually came from this game. The full song will be in the description. I'll show you a few seconds. The sound effects in Battlefield 1 are world class, and they're actually the best I've ever heard. According to Bentz, the audio director of Battlefield 1, this was due to the move from mono to stereo in the Frostbite engine. Bentz said, We started recording these events not only from varying distances, but also in different environments. A gunshot or an automatic rifle sounds very different when fired in a forest, in a concrete room, or out in an open field. This in turn, together with the memory constraints, led us to the next level of making guns and explosions. I'll give you a few seconds just to appreciate the carnage. The AI in 1942 is horrendous, and rightfully so for a game that's 14 years old, with AI still in its infancy. When in close combat, the AI can seem to have very good aimbot that'll destroy you immediately regardless of how fast you think you are, although they aren't smart, running straight over the field of battle without regard for taking cover or helping the teammates. But all in all, I don't believe that bots were ever meant to be studied in correlation to how the game is played, but rather give you an offline opponent to play or practice with since not everybody had the internet back in 2002. The lack of bots in Battlefield 1 seems to be more of a technical problem than a costly one at that. Having to reprogram bots to navigate destructible terrain that I would think would cause problems to their pathfinding logic. EA's executive VP stated in 2017 that AI is horrible at the moment, but will be much better soon thanks to the research funded through EA's Seed Division, which stands for Search for Extraordinary Experiences Division, that I honestly don't understand at the moment. As this article says, I think they've left it a bit vague, even when they're talking about how Seed is helping in an upcoming project. So he's hoping that bots are an easy addition in the near future. I believe as movies are preserved, our games should be too. Bots are a great inclusion in gaming, a necessity for those without an internet connection, or multiple PCs in their house to land with, even if the bots were terrible. Unfortunately as games age, their servers will be shut down with no further support, and without modding and cracking, these games will become unplayable decades down the line, and who would want to with no NPCs? Although, at least Battlefield 1 has a campaign, so at least you can still play the game. Within 1942, there are five classes, with no mention of what the weapons are, but you can guess. All these classes hold a pistol, knife, and three grenades. The classes are as follows. Scout, holds a sniper rifle and binoculars. Assault, with a high-powered machine gun. Engineer, holds anti-tank mines, remote detonated dynamite, a repair tool, and a rifle with no scope. Medic, holds a self-refilling medic kit and an automatic machine gun. And finally, the anti-tank class, with the bazooka. I guess I thought the bazooka was overpowered enough to warrant not giving them much more. Bear in mind, all of these classes will need to stock up on ammunition at one point, because they aren't very liberal with what they give you. This to my knowledge remains unchanged from Battlefield 1. Assault, Medic, Support and Scout are your four classes, seemingly merging the anti-tank and engineer class from 1942. There are also three special classes, Pilot, Tanker and Cavalry, that are spawned into with their own special equipment, but even more so, there's elite classes, like a flamethrower pack that you'll find in fixed locations on the map. The main differences between these two games is the sheer amount of weapons, hundreds of them, from different types of shotguns to rifles, 
all unlockable as war bonds. These are earned through gameplay, or you can just pay cash. Each separate class has their own individual ranking system that needs you to be a certain rank in that class to unlock certain weapons. And when you've reached that ranking, you can use your war bonds to buy weapons. Also, the same as 1942 in regard that you'll want to refill your ammunition a lot. Both games have kept to the fact that they aren't very liberal with ammunition, which I think is good. It puts more value on the support class, making each class valuable and not just a different type of gun, with very little benefit to any team, like I've seen in other games. And with how intense these close quarter battles are, they're even more valuable. To me, there's nothing that was done better in 1942 as far as classes go. All of the changes to Battlefield 1 feel like an evolution of the class system, making it overall better for the best player experience so far. 2002 came with a lot of good FPS games. Medal of Honor Allied Assault, Unreal Tournament 2003, No One Lives Forever 2, and my favourite, Delta Force Black Hawk Down. Coincidentally being the first multiplayer game Brendan Green, the creator of PUBG, fell in love with, and it really shows in his game. But through all of this, Battlefield stood out, outselling its closest competitor, Allied Assault, by 1.57 million copies. And ironically, Medal of Honor was retired by EA in 2012 after trying to make a comeback with Medal of Honor Warfighter and failing spectacularly, selling only 500,000 copies. Rightfully so, because the game was just overall very bad. During the time that Battlefield 1 has been out, it's had a lot of competition from the likes of Overwatch, PUBG, Fortnite, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Rainbow Six Siege, Call of Duty World War II, just naming a few, and overall it's been doing very solidly. To keep up with these games, each release of new content for Battlefield 1, they've released 4 to 6 new maps, keeping up with Battlefield 1942's release of Road to Rome expansion that also had 6 maps. Although, Secret Weapons of World War 2 had a massive 8. First person shooter sales have never been more competitive than they are now, and through that, Battlefield has kept the upward trend. As of the 27th of July 2017, Battlefield 1 had sold over 21 million copies, making it the best selling in the franchise yet. Whereas games like Cliffy B's Lawbreakers fail to even hit 100,000 copies sold according to Steam Spy, and consequently are shutting down their servers 6 months after the launch, 1942's success allowed it to become what it is today, and hopefully there's no end in sight for the franchise. The controls have 4 tabs. We have Common, Infantry, Air, and Land and Sea. All of these control settings use the same movement keys with the addition of mouse assisted movement in air and sea battles, with the tanks and cannons being swiveled with the mouse also. In 1942, every custom profile was able to have custom buttons, so there was no need to rebind any keys if your mate or sibling was accustomed to a particular way of playing. In Battlefield 1, under controls, you'll find most of the same options in 1942, except there's a lot more choice, with there being an option for nearly everything from zoom sensitivities in 0.25 increments from 1 to 10, to decoupling aiming from turning. Key bindings show us 7 tabs, Common, Soldier slash Gunner, Vehicle Driver, Pilot, Horse, Transport, Driver, and Spectator. The key bindings are very similar to 1942, except the F keys are no longer used for callouts, but vehicle positions. The option for joystick and game pads are also there. A lot is similar, but with 1942, to use a controller and joystick, you're required to use third-party software like Pinnacle Game Profiler that includes a pre-made 1942 profile. While Battlefield 1 has a huge array of extra control options that are natively added to the game that require no optimization or third-party software. Not a lot's changed in 15 years in regard to keyboard and mouse setups, which is probably a good thing. The game modes are interesting. Campaign, which isn't a campaign in the traditional sense, but more of a bot fest, where the difficulty is set by yourself, and if you didn't know they were bots, it would look like just a regular multiplayer match with flags to be captured and enemies to be destroyed. You basically just unlock further levels that are also playable in multiplayer. There's capture the flag. We had to steal the enemy's flag and bring it back to your base, like what's on Gulch and WoW, and the amount of times that's done is set by the host. Team Deathmatch. Well, the goal of this mode is to acquire the set amount of tickets to win. This game mode is vehicleless and relies entirely on infantry with no weapon restrictions. Objective based is exactly what it sounds like, defending and attacking a specific area to complete the objective. Co op mode allows for you to play every map with your friends, all 21 of them. Conquest is where both teams fight over designated flags within the map. All of these modes rely heavily on the addition of bots within the game. Internet connections weren't as good or reliable back in the 2000s, especially in Australia. Conquest. Well, you need to hold capture points and reach a thousand points first, which can be done by either holding the most flags and waiting, or killing enemies to reach your thousand first. Domination. Small map size, fewer points, but otherwise exactly the same as Conquest, but the goal is only a hundred points. Within smaller maps. Team Deathmatch. You all know this one. This is the first team to reach a certain number of kills wins. 
Rush, which is sectioned up. The attackers have a limited amount of tickets, with each death costing one, and you have to capture multiple posts in sequence to win. The defenders can also use telegraphs to call in artillery strikes. Front lines. A head-on conflict where the contested front line can move in both directions. Conquering a flag objective allows a team to advance closer to their enemy base. Once the team loses the flag objective closest to their base, they'll have to defend two telegraph posts inside their base. Supply drop. Boxes are periodically airdropped into the battlefield, secure the majority of supplies to win. Pigeons. Find a pigeon, hold it for a while, and then set it free and hope it flies away safely. First team to three pigeons wins. Operations is by far the most interesting in my opinion. There's an attacking and a defending team. The map is sectioned into five areas, and if the attacking team wins, you progress to the next section. And if they run out of tickets trying to push, they also get a few ways of reinforcements, like a behemoth, a giant bombing blimp. There's two to three flags per section. The defending team has to hold the line until the enemy ticket count runs out after three or so waves, whereas the defending team don't have a ticket count. There's also a new game mode for each DLC expansion so far. And unfortunately, because I don't have any of the DLC, I wasn't able to play many of these game modes, even the old ones, because of the region I lived in and the lack of players. An explosion of game modes over the past 15 years has created a more interesting and fast-paced way to play, with multiple sections and maps being used for modes like Operations and Rush. A huge leap from traditional modes of 1942 that were purely flag and ticket based. Don't get me wrong, in one way or another Battlefield 1 uses this formula but tweaks it with each game mode keeping it fresh. This goes to show that players are willing to give new game modes a go, because the payoff could be awesome fun. Okay, now for the fun section of random things that went unmentioned. In 1942, when aiming down the sights of the sniper and shooting, there will be a few seconds wait before you could scope again, making it super hard in the heat of the moment with no animation in place to help you zoom correctly. An animation would have saved this jarring feeling, but it's just an oversight. Also, the only class able to aim down the sights is unfortunately the scout, the rest are purely hip fire. Unmentioned here, but it is super obvious, is the resolution and how terrible it is. I found a widescreen patch after I'd recorded all the footage so that's unfortunate. In Battlefield 1, the map now displays action in real time, making it easier to make a decision on where you want to go. Melee combat is also better than ever, with the inclusion of bayonet charges, and some close quarters shovel melee, which is wicked. An evolution of a studio's ideas over the course of 15 years for a franchise that's only gotten stronger. Within these 15 years, they've changed with the industry, moving from physical expansion releases to DLC, creating new and interesting game modes, transforming the art of video games with insane graphics and audio and overall aesthetics of the series. Any studio that hopes to keep up with Battlefield would never have a lot of experience behind them. The worlds are by far the most brilliant they've ever been. The entire series has had an overhaul for the better, with the exception of a lacking modding scene and hopefully not an overreaching microtransaction scheme in the next game. Fingers crossed. Things are done right in my opinion are a large customizable class system, incredible new game modes, constant DLC releases, and a very modern approach to first person scene. I did however find myself getting overwhelmed in Battlefield 1 with how fast paced it was compared to its predecessor. That perhaps this was their vision all along and it just wasn't possible during the early days of development for 1942. And it's all just been an evolution of the company's creativity and capabilities. This is amplified by the fact that the internet is a lot better than it was 15 years ago. Which brings me to the customer experience. The benefits of a constant internet connection are huge. Near instant updates when a game breaking bug's found. No need to wait for the latest PC power play to come out to install the patch. And instant community feedback about game implementations. The grey line comes in when you hear about Star Wars Battlefront 2 and how the microtransaction model was so predatory that legislation from around the world has begun to be drafted. If the same happens with the Battlefield series, it'll be upsetting and feel like a defeat of the franchise to me. Hopefully they leave it alone and let the game speak for itself. This is my first big video and a little ambitious for somebody that's shit at writing. I hope it's covered enough bases to be satisfactory. I'd love feedback in the comments or wherever you can find me. Uh, thanks for watching and if you like more of this, uh, let me know. Subscribe, comment, giving a like on the video. It's all good. I have a lot of ideas, so thanks for watching dudes. I appreciate you.